to to focus on people speaking and try to follow the chat? So if there are questions in the chat, will you just chime in and, and let us know? I can also, I can also, uh, you can also text. Oh, we're live. <laughs> Sorry. We're okay. live. But yeah, I'll have the I'll have that in the chat box for you. Hey, so okay. you guys, just FYI, I don't know why my la this charger isn't charging my laptop. So if I cut out, I'm gonna be in another. I'll I'll call I'll call back in. Susan, we're, we are live, so I want to <laughs> welcome everybody. Hello, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Al Khair in Palestine. My name is Zaha Hassan. I'm a board member of P Build Palestine, and I'm really honored to have been part of pulling together the amazing group of creatives you're about to hear from today on this panel. These writers have their books on display for you at the Expo Center, so please go there and find out more about them and their books. I wanna remind the panel to conclude this session by each of you completing this sentence. I imagine, here's mine. I imagine a day when we do not have to be concerned with ensuring Palestine's physical place, one safely bounded by dots and dashes on a map, but instead our Palestine can just be what it already is, a boundless idea that traverses borders, climbs mountains, sails across seas, and inspires hearts and minds of even those who never knew her as a home. And now it is my privilege to introduce your moderator, Susan Mwadli Daraj. You can read Susan's many accomplishments on the website, but I wanna highlight a few things about her. In January, Susan came out with what must be the very first English language children's book series featuring a smart and spunky Palestinian girl as a protagonist. The series is called Farah Rocks. Her short story collection, A Curious Land, Stories from Home, won both the Arab American Book Award and the American Book Award in 2016 and the book was shortlisted for the Palestine Book Award. Susan is also the creator of the hashtag Tweet Your Thob, which started out as a celebration of the election of the first Palestinian woman to the US Congress and has become a celebration of Palestinian culture and Palestinian women more broadly. Susan is also just an amazingly generous human being with her time and her talent, sharing it with other Palestinian writers by mentoring them and helping them get their writing off the ground. I was a mentee of Susan, so I can attest to that firsthand. Yalla, Susan, let's build. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome to our panelists today, Susan and Salim. I want to thank Zaha and all the organizers of Build Palestine. This is really just an amazing, wonderfully inclusive and broad event. And I know it takes hours and hours of manpower and woman power to put it together. Um, we had another panelist who was supposed to join us today, Natalie Handal, who um, unfortunately could not join us at the last minute, but I just wanted to mention that Natalie is a really uh, amazing and prolific poet. Um, her books include Life in a Country album, The Republics and others. Um, she put out a really amazing anthology of poetry titled The Poetry of Arab Women. Uh, several years ago. It's the winner of the Penn Oakland uh, Josephine Miles Award, and it was named one of the top 10 feminist books by The Guardian, The Poetry of Arab Women, edited by Natalie Handel. So Natalie, next time, inshallah, you can join us. And now I'm proud to present our uh, panelists, Salim Haddad. Salim was born in Kuwait City, to a German, uh, Iraqi German mother and a Palestinian Lebanese father. He's worked with Medicine Sans Frontier and other international organizations in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Lebanon, and Egypt. His first novel, Guapa, was published in 2016, a political and personal coming of age story of a young gay man living through the 2011 Arab revolutions. The novel received critical acclaim from The New Yorker, The Guardian, and others, and it was awarded a Stonewall honor, and it won the 2017 Polari First Book Prize. Haddad was also selected as one of the top 100 global thinkers of 2016 by Foreign Policy Magazine. As if he doesn't have enough talent, his directorial debut, Marco, premiered in March 2019 and was nominated for the 2019 Iris Prize for Best British Short Film. Welcome, Salim. Ahlo Sahar. Thank you, Ahlan. Thank you for having me. Susan Abulhawa. 
is a novelist, a poet, an essayist, a falaha, a scientist, a mom, an activist, an armchair psychologist. She has written three international best-selling novels, a poetry collection, and several anthologies. Her debut novel, Mornings in Janine, was translated into 30 languages, and it made her one of the most widely read Arab authors around the world. Her most recent book, Against the Loveless World, was published by Simon & Schuster in August 2020, Mabruk, Susan, when it was immediately among the top reading recommendations by Good Morning America, CNN, New York Times, and others. When Good Morning America likes a Palestinian novel, this is, <laughs> this is incredible. Welcome, Susan. Ahla sahla. Thanks. And um, I thought we, we only have 45 minutes together, but I really wanted our audience to hear a little bit of your work. And I was wondering if you would, if we could begin by each of you reading just for a couple of minutes from, from one of your recent works. So Salim, would you like to begin? Sure. I, um, so I'm going to be reading from a short story that uh, I wrote that was published in 2000. It was published last year in an anthology called Palestine Plus 100. And the brief for that anthology was to imagine a future Palestine in 2048, 100 years after the Nakba. So it was a bit of a science fiction uh, brief. And it was my first time write, writing science fiction and my first time really writing fiction about Palestine. So. I'll be reading a little bit from that. Wonderful. The unraveling began on the beach. Since he had hanged himself the year before, Aya had felt, had felt haunted, saddled by the weight of things. The violence of his death only reinforced how unreal everything seemed, like she was trapped in someone else's memory. But as she stood on the shore under the late afternoon sun that day, the haunting had felt much closer like it had crawled under her skin and decided to make a home for itself there. Behind her on the sand, Aya's father was dozing under a giant yellow umbrella. Like all grown up, her father slept a lot, although no one slept as much as her mother, who was barely awake these days. Whenever life got a bit complicated, it seemed that all these grown ups could do was just drop off to sleep. Taking one final look back, she walked into the water leaving behind all the business of the beach, the loud, cheesy music blasting from the drone speakers in the sky, the smell of shisha and grilled meat, the screaming children and half-naked bodies running up and down the sand. Just another headache-inducing summer day in Gaza, she thought to herself as the waves softly lapped at her shins. She made her way deeper into the calm blue waters, her feet navigating the occasional piece of coral on the otherwise sandy seabed. The sea was so blue and the sky so clear, when the water reached her stomach, she turned around in slow circles, her fingers gently grazing the surface. Time passed more slowly by the sea. She learned that in physics class, how the hands of a clock placed at sea level run a fraction slower than those of a clock placed on the mountaintop. Sometimes she thought that she should go up and just live in the mountains. That way she would stop being 14 more quickly. Time would pass faster and she'd be a real grown up, do all the things she wanted to do. By the sea, she felt herself a prisoner of both history and time. But the good thing about time moving slower by the sea was that if she stayed there, she would remain closer to the last time she saw her brother. Maybe if she descended deep enough into the water, she could find a way to grind time to a halt and then push it back, back to the period before Ziad died. Maybe then she would find a way to stop it all from happening. She lay back and closed her eyes, allowing her body to float in the water. She could hear the song of the birds in the sky, the slow, familiar chattering. She dipped her ears below the surface, listening to the rumble of the sea. The sea, warm and inviting, seemed playful that day, licking the sides of her face. But underneath this playfulness, she felt something more sinister. She imagined the blue waters swallowing her, dragging her deeper until her body hit the seabed to join the thousands of others that had drowned in those waters throughout time. She wasn't sure she fell asleep, but a sudden putrid smell overcame her. She sensed something cold and slimy wrap itself around her neck. She opened her eyes, took in a gasp of breath. The stench made its way down her throat and her body shuddered. She reached for the thing around her neck and pulled it off, a soggy piece of yellow toilet paper disintegrating between her fingers. She flung the paper behind her and stood up in the water. Her feet found the seabed, which now felt spongy and slick. 
The water around her was a brownish green sludge. Sewage and shit bobbed on the surface. A rotting fish carcass floated by her right arm, casually bumping into an empty can of Pepsi. To her left, white foam gathered and bubbled on the surface of the water. Her body contracted as a giant wretch escaped her. A crackle of gunfire erupted on the horizon. She turned to the noise. Four or five gunboats bobbed further out in the sea, as if warning her not to advance any further. She turned back to the beach. The beachfront was unrecognizable. The string of hotels and restaurants were replaced by decrepit buildings wedged alongside each other, aggressively jostling for space. Smoke blooms hung in place of the colorful beach umbrellas. The music and chatter drowned out by gunfire. Above her, the sky was a furious gray. She shrieked for her father, wading through the dirty water. She pushed aside bottles, soiled tissue paper, plastic bags, and rotting animal carcasses. Her body jerked and convulsed continuously with what was something between a gag and a sob. A sharp stabbing pain tore through her body like someone twisting a knife deep inside her stomach. Stumbling onto the shore with seaweed in her hair, she looked like a deep sea monster emerging from the depths of the water. The sand was littered with plastic bottles, burning tires and smoldering debris. The sunbathing bodies had disappeared. Above her, jet planes roared, leaving in their wake trails of black smoke like gashes in the sky. A thundering explosion threw her to the ground. Her tongue tasted sand and blood. Baba, she whimpered, barely hearing herself. The pain in her belly intensified. Up ahead, three people were lying on the sand. She crawled towards them. The bodies were small, too small to be adults. As she got closer, she realized the bodies were of three children. They looked to sleep, but there were pools of blood, limbs contorted into impossible positions. A punctured football lay beside the lifeless bodies. There was a loud screaming in her ear, and she realized the screaming was coming from her. She stood up, looked down at her feet. A trickle of blood ran down her left leg. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. Thank you so much. And uh, again, that is from the uh, collection Palestine Plus 100, which I, I'm familiar with. It's a, it, it's exciting to see this kind of um, speculative fiction, right? Like it, it's it's amazing. It's it's a wonderful collection. So um, I'm I'm mm. excited that you read from that. Thank you. Susan, would you like to read for us just for a couple of minutes? We'd love to hear your work. Sure. Um, Celine, that was that was really lovely. Um, all right. So I'm just going to read a short passage from my new book, um, Against the Loveless World. Um, and just fair warning, there's um, there are a couple of curse words in here. So if anybody has kids and just, you know, <clears throat> be warned. Um, so this is just to set it up. Um, Nahir is the protagonist in this book, and she's recounting her life from uh, an Israeli prison cell. And um, and here she um, she talks about how she got uh, two of her names. Mama was pregnant with me when Israel made her a refugee for the second time. After fleeing Haifa in 1948, she had made a home with my father in Siti Wasfiya's ancestral village, Aina Sultan. Fleeing once more in June of 67, with only whatever they could carry, they walked more than eight kilometers to cross the River Jordan at the Allenby Bridge. When they got there, the bridge was overwhelmed with bodies and eventually collapsed, just as Mama was about to cross. Some people fell and had to be rescued. Some didn't make it out. But people kept walking on the collapsed bridge, holding on to its cables and broken pieces as they waded through the water. Mama told me, I just prayed to God as your father and I crossed, and I made a deal with the river. I said I'd name you after it if it didn't swallow any of us. But calling me Jordan would have been too strange. That's how I got the name Nahar, River. My father made the dangerous journey back to Palestine after he got us to safety in Jordan. Palestinians learned the first time in 48 that leaving to save your life meant you would lose everything and could never go back. That's why Baba stayed alone in our empty house for months under curfew while Israel con consolidated power over the whole of Palestine. To be alone in the eerie quiet of the emptied home where he and his siblings had grown up amid the daily bustle of a large family must have been painful. Still, he stayed and got a hawiya. He could thenceforth remain in Palestine as a foreign resident in his own home. He said it was better than being a refugee. 
Baba joined us as soon as he could, but his long absence had fractured our family. And by the time I was born, my parents had already made their way to Kuwait, where my father was fucking the first of many girlfriends. Her name was Yaqut, and that's the name he recorded on my birth certificate, not Nahar, without consulting my mother. He was probably with Yaqut the night Mama went into labor, probably a little drunk when he reached the hospital, and still basking in the glow of a romantic evening when he impulsively named me after his new lover, perhaps underestimating Mama's intuition and rage. Yaqut is an unusual name for Palestinians. One finds it more among Iraqis, which is why I figured my father's lover was a daughter of Babylon. It means ruby, and everyone agrees it's a rich and resonant Arabic name. But when Mama saw the birth certificate, she screamed and cried and hit my father. She smashed all the plates in our house, hurling a few at him as he ducked left and right. He let her vent, apologized, swore Mama was the only woman he loved, and promised he wouldn't do it again. They probably made love afterward, had a good run together for a while. Then the whole scenario was repeated with another woman. When she was pregnant the second time, Mama threatened to kill my father if he named the baby after one of his whores, but she didn't have to worry when she birthed the boy. My father named him Wasfi after his mother, Siti Wasfiye, which was just as bad as far as Mama was concerned. Needless to say, Mama never used our names, <clears throat> the names recorded on our birth certificates. She kept her promise to the river and called me Nahir. My brother Wasfi was Jihad, a name Mama chose, which became yet another point of contention between her and Siti Wasfiye. Only my family and some administrators at my school knew my real name was Yaqut, which had an element of fate to it, because when the Americans ousted Saddam, Kuwaiti police asked about someone named Nahar, but my identification card said Yaqut. My brother wasn't as lucky. People called him by either name or both, Wasfi Jihad. When the Kuwaiti police went on the hunt for Palestinians to exact revenge because Yasser Arafat had sided with Saddam, they knew who they were looking for. Jihad was only three years old when Baba died of a heart attack in the arms of another woman. Mama lied and said Baba was home when it happened. She made up an elaborate tale that shifted each time she told it. He was wearing the red flannel pajamas I bought for him, she would say one moment. The next, he'd be in the green pajamas for just his underwear. In that version, she had to dress him quickly before the ambulance came. Mama was a terrible liar, but the truth was too humiliating, even though everyone knew and Mama knew they knew. The lie wasn't just to protect her and us from shame. I think she wanted to protect Baba too. Despite everything, Mama loved my father very much and he loved her in his own way. Once in the heat of a fight over money, it was usually about money, Siti Wasfiya blamed Mama for the death of my father her only son. If you'd been a better wife, he wouldn't have had to go to other women, Siti Wasfiya had said casually as she ate the food Mama had prepared. If you'd raised a man who knew how to keep his dick in his pants and spent his money on his family instead of on whores, we wouldn't be having this argument, Mama fired back. That night, I heard her on the balcony apologizing to my dead father for what she had said. I forgive you, my love. I miss you. She spoke softly to the ether. Wow. Thank you, Susie. That was gorgeous. Yeah. Um, my, my first question and to sort of start our discussion is uh, literature is known as a dependable method for transforming people's thoughts and their perspectives. How do you feel that this principle has worked in terms of Palestinian identity and resistance? It's a very heavy question to begin with, but what, what, what does it mean to transform people's perspectives through literature? How does that work with us? Susan, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, that's fine. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a very big question. Um, and I think there's, a, there's always this tendency to either exaggerate the transformational power of literature or else to downplay it entirely. Um, 
I don't think, you know, that fiction has the power to create revolutions or to save lives or, or to bring down dictators in this very broad sense. But I, I, that doesn't mean that literature isn't transformational. And for me, I think the big, the big power of literature is that when, you're, when you are picking up a book, you're entering into someone's mind. And it's, it's a way to get inside someone else's skin, someone else's history and perspective and thoughts and way of thinking. And so the transformational power of literature really comes in its power to make us more uh, empathic people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think w when it comes to, to Palestine specifically, I think when you have a population that has historically been erased and dehumanized for, for such a long period of time, I think literature has a really important role to play both, not in the humanization, but, but more in making people understand um, the, the situation of, of Palestinians a bit more, and also uh, writing our presence into into the canon in a way. Mm. Susie, um, so I think you know literature and art in general are. I mean, I think they're necessities for life. You know, it's like it's food. It's 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 the food of of one soul, um, and. Art and literature and music are, and all, all the elements of one's culture are really the, it's, it's kind of the face of every society. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a defi, so in, in a way, the cultural productions of each society are what define that society. I mean, if you think of other cultures, um, you know, the things that come to mind are either their music, the way they dress, their novels, their poetry. Um, and so it becomes, and then, you know, Palestine is no different. Um, we, have, we have an ancient culture, very deep, uh, deeply rooted ancient uh, traditions, um, both literary and artistic and, and otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I, so I think of, of literature um, not so much as being a sort of a tool um, to, to change minds, um, quite the contrary. I mean, even though I don't really write for an audience, um, my, you know, the, my most important audience, the one that I'm affected by the most, um, are Palestinians. So I'm not necessarily, even though I write in English, and um, and that's unfortunately just a, a condition of exile. Um, I'm writing. Um, I'm writing first and foremost for for my characters and to tell their story honestly. Um, but my you know, the readership that I care about the most are, are Palestinians. Um, to see, to see, to see ourselves in literature, to have a, to have, you know, literature is this huge, vast terrain that, um, you know, in the same way that we've been excluded from the physical terrain of our heritage, we've also kind of been excluded from um, a literary terrain, an artistic terrain, um, especially you know on the on the international stage, not so much um, in the Arabic speaking world. But um, for those of us who live in exile, there's definitely been an exclusion. And so, um, in a way, it's it's kind of staking our claim and um, and 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 carving out space in this vast terrain of of world literature and um, and, and making a place for people who look like us, who speak like us, who, you know, who dance like us and sing like us. And, um, and more importantly for people, um, for this collective wound that we all exist in, no matter, no matter what country we're in, no matter, you know, no matter where fate took us, we all exist on this common wound of, of having been um, either expelled or occupied by by foreign powers, and so that's the thing that unites us all. And and, um, and literature, we get to reflect that in literature, and we get to find each other um, in literature. More importantly, I wanted to to get back to this idea of uh, you know we are all writers in exile. We live in the diaspora. We all grew up in different places. Even Natalie, who was supposed to be with us today, grew up between I believe Latin America and France. Um, so we are living in the diaspora, we are in exiles, but how does it feel when you are described as a Palestinian writer? And can you talk about, can you talk about some of the reactions that you've experienced, um, to your work from readers, from reviewers in general, to you being a palace labeled as a Palestinian author? 
because we're Palestinians who write in English, right? We're not writing in Arabic. Um, Susie, maybe you can go first on this one. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I'm of two I'm of, sorry, you guys, my dogs. Okay. Um, <laughs> He's intrigued by the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm of two minds on this issue. Like on the one hand, um, I'm very proud to to be a Palestinian writer. You know, I I don't. That's a that's an a hugely important part of component of my identity. On the other hand, it sort of um, it you know what's implicit in that is that you know white <laughs> is the default. You know, nobody ever says, "Oh, he's a white writer, white writer from you know Minnesota or something like that." But but the rest of us always kind of get this hyphenated um, authorship. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, which is annoying. So, um, but on the whole, like I, when I describe myself, I, I will say a Palestinian writer because I, you know, because Palestinian just has a cool edge to it. And, and it's, it's something I'm hugely proud of. And it, uh, it roots me in, in a particular region that I write about. So I don't mind it. Um, but I do mind the idea that, you know, that, that white is the default. I mean, there was a time when people used to use the term, uh, she's a lady writer or a lady doctor, you know? I mean, that's that's so antiquated. A poetess. Uh, now, right, but so, yeah, a poetess, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it kind of goes along along those lines and like just, just what it, the reason it's stated, I guess, is what I have a problem with. Now, I've, you know, what flows from that is a whole set of questions that are reserved for non-white writers. And that's the part that I, that really annoys me because I'll, you know, I'll get, I've literally had, had people on stage say to me, um, one, one interviewer at a literature festival said, don't you ever just want to write about something normal? That's one. Um, another woman grabbed, you know, she it was my second novel was out. Um, she was an interviewer. She's actually a well-known literary um, critic and said, you know, this novel that to me is, is an expansive love story, right? She, she said, you know, this is a very angry novel. And then her questions flowed from there. Um, I've been asked, how did you manage this is about the blue between sky and water, which has, you know, five different five women in Gaza from the same family. Um, she, she said, and she was quite serious. And she said, um, how did you manage to make them all so different? Like these are, you know, they're different, they're separate women, but you know, what's, there's so much, it's such a loaded question in that, like, what's implied is that, you know, we're all pretty much homogenous and it takes effort to, to, to distinguish characters from each other and have them have different personalities. Um, and then the questions always are always, almost always sort of turn, you know, political, uh, um, which is, you know, I don't mind, I'm an activist and, and I, and I chose in that life, but the assumption that, that, that that's all I have to talk about is sometimes offensive. Um, particularly when I have spent, you know, no less than three years creating a cultural production that um, that I that that I consider a piece of art, or I, I hope it's considered a piece of art. Um, so you know, there's there's so again, so just to summarize, it's not the label itself; it's all the reductionism that comes with it, and all the um, the implied, the implied things, um, the implied assumptions that that undergird that um, hyphenated authorship. Yeah, yeah, Salim. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, Susie, what you touched on in the end, I think, is really links very much strongly to to the fact that we write in English as well, because I think you know, writing in English, you know, the, the language itself becomes a political context. So. The, you know, even when you look at a translated piece of work, the way that it's read in Arabic and then the way that it's read in English, you can be reading the same piece of literature, but then because it's in a different language, it suddenly transforms the meaning and, and you know, uh, the, the, the imagery that you have and, and, the, and the wider sort of, you know, how the imagery interacts with the language outside of the, of the novel itself. Um, 
And I think, you know, it, I mean, for, for me personally, it's a bit of a complicated situation because my background's quite mixed. You know, my father is Palestinian Lebanese and my mother is Iraqi German. And, and in some ways I feel quite lucky because I have this large cultural well to draw upon when I'm writing. And that's what I've been doing. I write about, you know, all of these different uh, cultures and countries and, and societies. The downside of that, of course, is that I have this sense of never feeling like I have any sort of legitimacy or authority to speak about any one particular place. But I think I increasingly just overcome that by just writing. And then, you know, that's it. Um, but I think the challenge that, that I think we face as, as Arab writers and as Palestinian writers, especially writing in English is, you know, and I think in Arabic, but I think in English, you know, for me, that's been my experience is that, you know, there's this obligation to make your literature one of resistance and politics. And that if you aren't writing about the conflict and if you aren't writing about certain issues, then you're betraying someone or something or yourself or, or, the, or the, the wider context in which your work is going to be understood and read. Um, and I think as a writer who not only writes about Arab issues and politics, but also writes about sexuality and, and issues around the LGBT community, that's something that is, you know, double, uh, the double of an issue. Um, I mean, for me personally, politics is infused into my writing. It's, you know, I, I've tried to write uh, a horror story or a sex scene, and then suddenly politics finds a way to just come into whatever scene that I'm trying to write, but that's just the type of writing that I enjoy doing. Um, and I and I believe that the personal is political. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a very broad, there are some thoughts around, around that, around being a Palestinian uh, writer writing in English. If, if I could share an experience as a way to uh, kind of enter my next question or preface my next question. When I was, uh, when I was, when my agent was pitching my uh, children's book series. So this, this is the first book series that has a Palestinian character as the protagonist, right? So it's a four, it was a four books, possibly eight. And so we were, he was pitching it to different um, publishing houses. And this is, touches on what Susie said earlier, the, the questions that were asked by these very liberal and very open-minded uh, progressive or uh, editors in these publishing houses was, well, well, would it get, would a Palestinian character gain a wide readership? You know, mm -hmm. like would she, as a character, would Farah, the character's name is Farah, would she appeal to children who are not Arab? Wow. Right, exactly. <laughs> and it's the same problem that I think, um, for example, black authors, mm -hmm. like would a, would, a, would a character, would a, would a book, a children's book with a black character on the cover appeal to what, what they're really yeah. Of course, oh, white the, the default white reader. There's the default white writer, but there's the default white reader. So mm -hmm. anyway, we found a publishing house that um, was happy to take on the project and they've done a wonderful job uh, with, with Farah and they even found a wonderful illustrator for Farah. So I'm, I'm in good hands now, but it was a really difficult experience. So my question for you is, what do you feel are some of the ways in which the publishing industry, both in the States and Europe, around the world, marginalizes the Palestinian stories that we have to tell or the stories that we have to tell as Palestinians? Um, I mean, I can speak for myself. The interesting thing about, about being part Palestinian is that people can pick and choose to ignore the Palestinian side. And I think that's what a lot of people did initially with the publication of, of Guapa, which was this gay story. So people were very fixated on, on the gay Arab element. And then when I was, and then w once they sort of discovered that I'm part Palestinian, that I'm, I'm quite outspoken uh, in support of Palestine and Palestinian rights, you can see this like hesitation. Um, and I remember, you know, I wrote an essay about my grandmother's experience of the Nakba, and this came out. Uh, a year before my, my novel was published and I got an email from someone very high up in the literary in industry, basically warning me, saying that I was committing professional suicide and I was destroying my literary career before it, was, it even started. And you know, when you're an unnamed writer with no literary connections and you receive this, this email from someone very high up, it can be quite terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of phrased in a, I'm giving you advice, but it was very clearly a threat. 
And this person, you know, then I never heard from them again. And, you know, even though I should have been hearing from them, given who they were in relation to, to my novel. Um, so you can see that there is antagonism there and it sort of comes up. So I've had this experience of once my Palestinianness has, has risen to the surface, then I've, I've been met with, with resistance and with a lot of antagonism and mistrust. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm 100% Palestinian. My parents are cousins, so <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have any alternate identities. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, it, there's definitely um, hesitation to publish um, Palestinian authors, particularly when they're um, when the work is uh, when it's not kind to Israel. Um, you know, they'll, they'll now accept you know books that you know I hate the word humanize, but just sort of present Palestinian Palestinians in our you know in human terms. Um, but it's a whole nother question when you um, when Israel is presented in in, a, in their true light, um, and so for example, with my with my most recent book, um, despite the success of Mornings in Janine and and the Blue Between Sky and Water, when my agent was shopping, um, I wanted to kind of go with a, um, a new publisher in the US for various reasons. But when she was shopping it around, she was a little bit shocked how difficult it was to sell this book because, um, you know, she said, I mean, I thought with your platform and, and the, your record of book sales, et cetera, um, that, you know, this would be easy. And and she, it was a lesson for her as well. Like, um, and, and she's a woman of color, and so she already understands how white publishing can be, and um, how resistant they are to, to to just to voices that contradict their concept of the world, their 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 conception of, of who Arabs are, and um, it's just. In, a, in another example, actually, I, um, I I actually had to cave on removing a line from this book. Um, there's an Iraqi, um, even though, I mean, I, I love my publisher, actually. I'm, um, I'm published with Atria, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Uh, and I've had the extraordinary great fortune of working with all women of color um, at Atria, from, you know, publicists to the editors to the assistant editors. Um, but there's a line in there, um, an Iraqi, uh, uh, Kuwaiti older woman makes a comment about 9-11. And um, uh, and I had to take it out. I basically, you know, they 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 said it was either, I mean, it was, um, you know, it was a battle. And at first, I was like, no way. I'm like, what is this? You know, this is a fictional character, a fictional Iraqi character can't make an honest, um, you know, comment about how glad she is it happened. And um, uh you know, which would be a natural reaction to to the destruction, the wholesale destruction of an ancient culture like Iraq, right? Babylon is just the cradle of civilization and just reduced to 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 misery and rubble. And um, and it became kind of it. You know, I was told that basically um, the book would not you know, the sales team would not be enthusiastic about pushing it. And there would be this all subconscious thing. The book would just because of that one line. So for me, then it became a choice between two characters, right? Do I, am I going to be loyal to the main character, Nahid, or to Umburak, who is, who is a, she's not a minor character, but this was just one line in there. And I was allowed to keep, you know, the, where she says, I'm glad it happened. Um, but the other line that she said was, um, you know something else so anyway um but yeah so there is there's still um there's there's censorship in in the uh, in the industry uh, in the industry there's in it and it comes in the way of um not choosing not choosing literature that um that upsets the status quo in some way <laughs> so by the way um Susan, there's, I don't know if you see, there's a bunch of questions in here. 
in the chat. Yeah, I'm oh. looking at them now. Um, okay, uh, we have a question here. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm terrible at moderating chat. This is, this is probably not the best um, job for me. Okay, how do you write in a way that the doesn't alienate some people in your audience from our community, um, people who might not react well? And how do you keep it deeply personal, but also applicable beyond the confines of your own stories? It's about writing the personal, but also writing towards mm. your audience. Talk on that. So I don't write for an audience and I don't really care who I offend and, or don't offend. And, and, and as a matter of fact, like, um, I'm, you know, I'm sorry readers, um, but I don't, I don't think about my publisher. I don't think about the readers. I don't think about the money. I just, I really, I am, I have keep a one track mind and trying to really, um, be loyal and to the characters and only the characters to telling their story, um, authentically and honestly. Um, this latest book was slightly an exception because it dealt with a lot of themes that um, that are replete with Orientalist traps that I I was terrified of falling into um, because it you know it um, uh, it deals with patriarchy sexual exploitation <laughs> um, and and some of the uh, it, it it comes to you know it it talks about you know some of the Arab men who who are uh, who 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 are purveyors of this kind of sexual um, uh, um, predatory behavior and um, I didn't you know there's it's a fine line like you don't want to you don't want to fall into Oriental traps, but you need to tell the truth and be honest and, and be true to the characters. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, you know, there, that, that, that was the only time when I really was kind of not so much thinking of the care of the readers, but of um, just, just objectively about the text, I guess, and, and keeping sort of a, uh, <laughs> um, a, socio-political analysis in my brain at the same time so mm -hmm. and we just have a couple of minutes left but i want to hear salim's thoughts on that issue yeah i'm just looking at some of the other questions in the chat uh, do you think that your career as writers maybe benefited from not living in palestine yes yeah, of maybe. course very 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 simple answer i think there's so many other um you know legal and bureaucratic and and visa issues to do with living in Palestine. And I think as well, when you're living under occupation, it really can stifle your imagination because you're just trying to survive day to day. So it's a real privilege and luxury to be able to, you know, live in a position where you do have rights and you do have the, the space to be able to think and imagine. It is a luxury. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the initial question, um, I, I agree I agree with, with what, what Susie said for the most part. I think when I'm doing my first draft, it's very important for me to not think about audience and to just write you know, something that feels true to me. And that's what I measure what I'm writing against. Uh, but given that I'm writing in English, I'm also aware of, of, the, of the context that I'm writing in. So in subsequent drafts, I do start to think about how different people might be reading the story in different ways. And I'll often have different types of readers read the story to just get their perspective and then make adjustments, try and subvert their assumptions and play with them, be a bit playful with it. Um, so it's less about offending people and it's more about how can I maximize the, the power of literature in order to get people thinking, different people thinking in different ways and challenging people in different ways. Mm -hmm. Can I um, just uh, respond to the question about living in Palestine? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, it's the opposite for me um, because having, um, I mean, I did live in Palestine and my experience, um, I was, you know, I was much younger, um, but my experience there has really informed my writing to a great extent. In fact, in Mornings in Janine, um, there's a whole chapter that's actually autobiographical um, it's called The Orphanage and, and it um, chronicles, I put the lead character in my life when I lived at that same orphanage in Jerusalem. So. But yes, definitely, like as Selim said, that having the distance and the freedom to write what we want um, is definitely beneficial. The the question of like exile and being exiled is, is a really interesting one. I don't think we have the time to go into that. But yeah, I, I think it raises a really interesting 
limitation. Yeah. Yeah. We have just one minute left and I want to get to the final question, which is um, what do you imagine for Palestine? And we'll close with that. And if you don't mind, I'll go first. I imagine for Palestine, the freedom to write its own many authentic stories. How about you guys? I don't really, you know, I don't, I don't feel I need to imagine. I just, it, you know, I, I, I want the Palestine that was. I want the Palestine that was borderless, that was um, multi-ethnic, multicultural, um, <clears throat> multi-religious, uh, innovative, um, beautiful. <laughs> you know, it was. It, it, the past is the ideal that I want. So. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've put down, um, I imagine for Palestine, a prosperous and, and vibrant region where people of different religions, ethnicities, genders, and sexualities can live together in peace and justice. Mm. Thank That's you. simple. <laughs> Guys, I feel like we could talk for two more hours, but we are out of time. And it's just been such an honor to share this virtual stage with you very much. I really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your energy today. Thank Likewise. you. It was a pleasure. It's an honor for me too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks to everyone for joining in. Bye, Salim. Thank you. Bye. Salim. Bye.